you have any questions to Dan, go ahead. Um, otherwise, we have about 15 minutes to discuss the topic in general. So you can remember way back to before lunch any of the topics that were, uh, were talked about. Um, check in here. Okay. I have a question coming up to the mic or I don't know if this thing is working. So Dan, Dave, is the water at the lunar pole an ISRU resource that we absolutely have to have, or is it a rich that's going to cause the entire exploration effort to collapse? The way out of resource disease is smart planning. And there are plenty of countries that are actually blessed by huge resources that are smart enough to uh, manage them correctly. So I would say that that is a net positive, a big net positive, and uh, it will not cause the economy to collapse. How about asteroid metals? Ast uh, asteroid metals? This isn't a, well. Again, there are ways of dealing with this. Um, you can deal with it the way Nigeria has dealt with resources, or you can deal with it the way Norway has. And what Norway does is it says, well, this stuff is not to be spent today. So it doesn't impact the economy and inflation and increase imports. What they do is that they go, they, they toss it in their, uh, their uh, uh, sovereign wealth fund. And so it's either the biggest or the second biggest sovereign wealth fund. And they go off and they buy whole industries overseas. And they have you know, half a trillion dollars and say, well, that's for future generations. So there are easy way to, ways to deal with this. So with all the science that we have and all the great technology then, if you would take what you know from the economics and the anthropology and the geology and look ahead, can you identify examples where, aside from the Norwegian one, where people have done it right? And so even when you look at planetary protection, that's only to prevent microbes, contamination that is biological microbes. We have yet to have anything written down about exploration and things like environmental management and use. And so can you, from your historical perspective, look at something where you could say, here's an example that we should emulate? Um, no. Oh. <laughs> Basically, all of them um, uh, were not exactly taking a, a high moral tack in their exploration from a historical perspective. Um, what I think needs would be a useful uh, area of research is to look at the, um, the exploration issues that can come down the pike in 50 years or so in terms of this historical perspective for, say, Mars or the moon or whatever. But um, I have a day job. So I'll think about that. But, uh, but you know, it would be nice if it, if it was part of an RNA program. J.L. Galacho from the Minor Planet Center. So if I look at your talk from the opposite perspective, it would seem that you would advocate for us to not establish contact with an advanced civilization. Not at all, although there are substantial dangers there. That's, that's actually another interesting talk. Um, you look at how primitive societies uh, uh, relate to um, advanced societies. And of course, uh, the, the plus side is that there's a huge opportunity for studying that advanced society and making, a, making huge leaps in technology and social development. The downside, of course, is that your, your Stone Age society, based on, on whatever it's based on, is going to change radically. And I don't think change is inherently bad, but it's, use, but it's the sort of thing that you need to think about and you need to manage with appropriate incentives. I was just wondering if the civilization looked at us, not like we may look at a Stone Age society, but like we look at those big flightless birds. Yeah. There's always that problem. Well, the, 
if you if you want an interesting example, look at cargo cults. You familiar with cargo cults? Yep. Um, you know, that's a Stone Age society relating to an advanced society that they see. And it's not like these guys are dummies. They do it right. You know, uh, uh, the, for those that don't know, cargo cults are, were in the like, North Co Stone Age tribes in the north coast of New Guinea. And they saw these guys cutting big swaths of jungle down and making these long rectangular strips and then putting up towers and little boxes with little whippy things and talking into a can. So, and then planes would show up and dump stuff out, dump cargo out. And they thought, wow, you know, is that all there is to it? We can do that. We can cut the long rectangular strips out and put up these towers and talk in the cans. And you know, if you're, you're flying a C-47 in the north coast of New Guinea in thunderstorms, one rectangular strip in the jungle looks pretty much like another, and it works sometimes, you know. Plane lands, they realize they're surrounded by a bunch of cannibals, dump all the cargo out and take off. It works. So we might be at, you know, we might be at the, at the level of the bone through the nose uh, New Guinea cannibal, but they learned a lot. Papua New Guinea is an independent country now, and you know, just because they're, uh, you know, your grandfather was in the Stone Age, it doesn't mean you can't be a planetary scientist today. And they did, you know, they did 2,000 years of development in about 50. So it's worth it. It's, it's just worth. stuff changes. Margaret, I have a question for you, actually. Uh, several of the talks this morning talked about the proving ground and um, different ways that we might use the proving ground moving forward towards Mars exploration. Um, how does um, planetary protection fit into that? What are some of the things we could do at the moon despite it being an airless body? What could we learn that would help us better prepare for down the road the moons of uh, Mars and Mars itself? Well, um, obviously there aren't direct um, correlations between the two, but for instance, um, people do work in wind tunnels or they work with simulants that are soils like Mars or soils like the moon. And we know that the astronauts when they were on the moon had a lot of trouble with um, dusts and their suits. So dust, as I said, has the problem of being a, a fouling problem and uh, if the dust have microbes, then you've got corrosion and problems. Or it could be something to get into lungs or it could be something that affects your suits. So if you're doing research on something like dust, you could think about the applied issues associated with dust, not just, um, not just dust per se, because it's a good science problem. Obviously, you'll still do the dust science, because that's the good science. But be mindful of these other things. You may be sitting on top of something that could be a, um, an opportunity for additional research, a direction that others haven't thought of. So suits is one. Um, certainly microbes and their dissemination, contamination control of all sorts, uh, and how microbes exist. And again, if you could show, for instance, that the hardiest birth organisms don't survive in the conditions that are up on Mars or the moon or whatever, you've essentially said there's not the same forward contamination problem. So it's, um, I can't, besides the ones that are thinking about the suits and the, the food and the health and things like that, it's hard to know. So I would encourage many of you to take a look at this report that's coming out, because you may see something that makes a lot of sense to you. Right. Still have several minutes, so up oh, here. You want me to toss it, Carly? OK. Uh, well, this is probably a question for you and maybe a few of the others um, this, from this morning. I want to talk, come back to the low latency discussion. Um, which, which uh, I can't imagine that not being part of, of, of future exploration activities. However, um, I don't think anybody mentioned a, another capability that has to be coupled to it, and that is you have to have wonderful high bandwidth in order to communicate. And the, our abysmal uh, communication network uh, Certainly at the moon, uh, it's marginal at Mars because you have to keep adding communication components to each 
satellite at Mars. So, so this whole concept of serious communication links and high band, you know, high frequency, which is insane not to have in the current age. I mean, every kid expects high definition video from everywhere. And if you have a picture a day, you know, that's not going to make it. It's going to be the Stone Age. Um, so I was surprised that that was not a component in any of these discussions of the low latency that's needed for, for this kind of activity. Communication is right up there as a major need, and nobody mentioned it. You want to mention it? <laughs> well, in my personal defense, one slide that I had did have a few arrows pointing between an astronaut on the station and a rover on the ground, and it had a kind of a question area about defining so my talk in particular was about trying to begin defining what are the right questions to ask. Like, what is low latency telerobotics? How is it going to be enabled? And so from my perspective, bandwidth is absolutely one of those parts. So if we start developing technology to the point where we can do some of this in a testing mode, bandwidth would certainly be part of that. I, I can't imagine it wouldn't be. I agree with you 100%. I thought it was very interesting yesterday, some of the talks um, from our colleagues from the European Space Agency talking about the potential cadence for putting orbiters around the moon for communications capabilities. Um, I can't imagine that that wouldn't be part of a global plan for exploration anywhere else in the solar system. Uh, we, we have to be able to talk. Yeah, perfect starting point for it. Yes, so in that context, I'm reminded of the discussion we had Sunday at the resource prospector meeting, and, and it's, it's a recurring issue. It came up last year uh, when the resource prospector mission followed the, the forum, and, and that is this issue of, of calm latency and bandwidth. So right now, um, the DSN is not guaranteeing better than 20 seconds one way calm time from the moon to mission control. That's not real time. And that's at, you know, roughly 100 kilobits, maybe 500 kilobits per second. That's small potatoes. And if you're going to do something like HDTV, HD video, which, as Carly says, the public is going to expect, you need more than megabytes per second, megabits per second. So somebody needs to think about the infrastructure, not just the spacecraft, but the infrastructure. That it seems to me, I mean, if NASA doesn't do that, it's building itself out of existence. I mean, that is reality. That's what current society does and expects. If NASA does not follow through with that, it's 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 old hat, you know. Somebody who's younger than I should probably mention it. <laughs> Victoria, you're the perfect person. <laughs> You will notice in the discovery call that Optical Com was a portion of a couple of the proposals. Uh, so I can tell you that there's a lot of um, development activity going on about it. We don't have it manifested on a direct, you know, I can't tell you it's going to launch in yada yada. The other side of it is the ground-based infrastructure. So HEO is responsible for the Deep Space Network. HEO is looking at upgrades. It's looking at the infrastructure for things like Optical Com, how we can expand that, and how we can enable that broadband width stuff. Um, and I guess I need to add a second question that I can get an answer on, because I do believe that we've got uh, something out on that, okay, on expanding the ground-based infrastructure along with to benefit Optical Com. Okay? So we'll get you an answer. And just one other quick point. Um, in the last six months or so, there were two meetings, again, looking forward to Mars uh, in DC, the Affordable, uh, Affordable Mars and the Humans to Mars Summit. And at both of those meetings, I, I was at both of them, and there were, a, this had all the, the commercial partners, and the commercial partners were certainly talking about this as well. 
supporting this and driving this part of it. it so again, it's you know NASA's doing what NASA does, but there's also the whole collaborative effort, which hopefully together we'll be walking that way. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sort of to reinforce this, in 1990, when Rand did the uh, project outreach report in support of the uh, Space Exploration Initiative for Long Duration Missions to Mars, high bandwidth for virtual presence for public uh, constituent participation in the mission was assumed as a baseline necessity. 1990. Uh, both not only for the science, but that we needed to engage the public and that in order to do that we needed very high bandwidth uh, suitable for virt virtual reality at the surface. So the public could feel total immersion in the environment. So next gen, make it happen, I guess is the, uh, is the point there. So Brad's creeping up the side here and folks are accumulating in the back. So. Um, Thanks for the discussion and uh, to the presenters, uh, thanks for helping us stay on time, it's an enjoyable session.